let's ask, why did you run for governor? I mean, what was, what was the... So I, look, the issue of economic inequality to me is the defining issue of our time. Mm. There is no question. It is why I believe we're seeing this growing nationalism. We're seeing the divisions politically. Historically, any time the economy contracts and the pie is only so big, you see sort of white nationalism. You see all these things. Growing tension. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Right. Bob, this is the first time in a generation that the children of parents will not do better than they did. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that, is a, that is a fact that I just mm -hmm. put out there. Mm -hmm. um, people are feeling it every day. Mm -hmm. So I made the decision to run for governor. You know, Massachusetts is in the top five states as far as in income inequality, um, lack of, of economic mobility. Um, the country is in the same place as well. Mm -hmm. We're a microcosm of what's happening in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. I, for me, being a beneficiary of economic mobility. I mean, my story is of economic mobility. My story is of family in poverty, able to move up, next generation moves up. That's the story of America. It should be. It is not the story of America right Today, now. Yeah. And it needs, to, it, it needs to be, and it's gonna take some courage for people not just to make pronouncements, but actually be able to do the work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the reasons why, uh, Bob, you know, you and I, you know, bonded, man. I mean, going back, back 2012 now, I mean, you feel it, you know it, yeah. you've seen it, and I think, and, and we know it. And so that's why I ran, that's why, and I think that should be the centerpiece. Yeah. I think Massachusetts has this history of boldly leading the country, and it's unsatisfactory, you know, really disappointing from my perspective that we're not leading now. So I really appreciate you both putting yourselves out there. It's not easy to run for governor. So from my generation, we definitely appreciate bold leaders, you know, stating how we should be acting now. We can't wait. We have to act now, yeah. courageously. Uh, I'm just curious, from a experience standpoint, what do you think we can do to improve our election systems? I know we talked about debates. Is there a better way to frame election cycles? Do we shift to public financing elections? You know. The media might be a whole different topic, but mm -hmm. what, what okay. were some of the... <laughs> 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 but what did, what did you learn? What do you think could be improve in our Massachusetts state system for elections? Well, I'm a strong believer in, in uh, public campaign financing. I just think, not just because of what happened to me, where I it was, had a hard time raising money, but I just think it takes the influence out of uh, the state houses, the capitals. It allows for someone to be able to make the case in a clear way uh, to the people they want to represent and not have a lopsided scenario where, you know, candidates are spending X amount of time fundraising and Most. or, you know, they come in, they're fortunate enough to come in with a big Rolodex or personal funding. That should not determine who becomes, you know, a state rep, a governor, or a congressperson. Mm -hmm. I mean, it should not. So I believe we've got to level the playing field on that uh, public financing. Second, we've got to just be honest about making the voting easier for people. I mean, I, you know, and I'm not, this isn't an attack against anyone, but you know, why can't we have voting on the weekends? Mm. Right. You know, why can't we, we, there's all sorts of creative things to make it mm. more flexible and easier for people to be able to vote, um, among other things. So those are just two thoughts I have around it. Um, if we want maximum participation, I mean, there's so many working people here in the, the Commonwealth around the country to, wait in line you know diff people have shifts i mean how do you how do you ask people to mm. you know you got kids you got this it's really on a tuesday on a tuesday right yeah. i mean you know i mean so i i just think we gotta step it up here uh if i can add something to this you know one it's sort of to link what you were talking about before one problem that i found because we don't have public financing is that you're spending a lot of time talking to affluent people uh, or trying to, if they'll That's take true. your call. That's and true. the, but the That's perspective true. of affluent people is really very different, yeah, very because true. Um, very true. so my uh, more affluent friends, That's some true. of whom were generous and supported me, but others said, "Look, Bob, um, the only thing that matters is Donald Trump, and Charlie Baker's not doing that bad a job, and you know, I I want to put my effort into getting uh, Congress back, uh, which I understand. I mean, certainly I uh, I want to oppose Trump." But 
this was partly from the perspective of someone who, if they didn't like the school system they're in, they put their kid in a different school system. They didn't like the health care they were in, they put, they'd buy additional health care. They didn't like the home they were in, they'd buy a different home. So the real uh, uh, difficulties that you and I encountered, and that you don't have to go very far, you just have to basically come off Beacon Hill a little bit, you see people struggling with housing, not able to get education, not you know being crushed by their medical bills, and all of that, but the funding class doesn't really realize or doesn't care. I like to think it's more the first. So that's part of the structural problem that right now, and in Massachusetts, we need leadership focused on the people who are being, uh, whose whole lives are being slowed down because of the withdrawal or the refusal to provide very basic steps in, on the ladder. Um, the people who really have a tremendous influence over the elections uh, and, the, and the money don't have a connection with that. I don't know if either let, of let, let me add to that a little bit. I think going beyond the political fundraising thing, I also have sort of centered in on a couple other areas. Yeah. How do we measure success in the United States mm. economically? I think we need to take a really close look at the measurements. GDP does not represent the economy as we're talking about it. It does not represent how people are doing in their everyday lives, putting food on the table, putting gas in the car if they have it. Happiness. It, mm. I mean, the basic economics, it does not show that most people don't have over $400 of reserves in the bank. Right. It right. doesn't reflect any of these things. The second thing that doesn't reflect that is the unemployment rate. Mm. We have not seen wage growth, real wage gro growth in decades. You know, it, 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 that's a big deal. When you have the cost of living that goes up every year, over the course of 40 or 50 years, and you don't have real wage growth, that's a problem. You're getting a pay cut mm -hmm. every single year. Mm -hmm. So there is some interesting ways to measure uh, um, you know, what, what we're trying to head to. Back to my outcomes discussion, I always talked about, you know, eliminating economic inequality. One of the things we did in Newton that we, t we, we put together was, what is the income level one would need to have mm -hmm. to be self-sustainable in, in Newton? What is that income level for a single person, uh, head of household, you know, uh, with kids, we did it on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And we put that together, we put that, we used some, one economist from Boston College and did that. We need to start to become creative about measuring that and then driving towards it for the citizens. Um, and that's another piece to this. Bob, you're absolutely correct. We also are very segregated from a class perspective mm -hmm. and social network perspective. So a lot of folks don't realize, a number of people, that are doing okay, that are socially connected, um, that are doing quite well, don't see, that you can't see it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's an article today, I think in the Globe, uh, one of the publications where, um, you know, Boston's struggling with this housing question. Over a little around half the income, uh, household incomes in Boston, is $35,000 $35, a year mm -hmm. in Boston mm -hmm. with this booming economy. So there's a, even within, you know, a place like Boston where you see this, all this growth, um, there's, an, there's an underlying issue of basic household economies, how people are doing. So I wanna, in, we, that needs to be injected Absolutely. into this conversation. I think this is the right way to fit this in here. I also went to Boston College. Oh, okay. Um, I was political science, I started out with history. So I had like political science, you know, the importance of history as my background. And I really, truly believe that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And you just literally said the word underlying issues. Are there any other underlying concepts that you think are not being discussed in today's media paradigm that we really need to push to the forefront of the conversation? I do. Um, the other piece of this is ownership. This is a big, you used to talk about this, Bob. Mm -hmm. um, ownership means wealth for middle class people means freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom to make decisions, as you talked about, Bob. Mm -hmm. Free, you know, you have the ability to dip into a, your mortgage if you if there's an emergency, mm -hmm. right? Into that, if you have a house, if you have ownership of that, if you have ownership or equity in a company. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we need to have an ownership question because 
at, we're now at a point where we have we are going we're declining in home ownership because young people are taking on so much student debt. Uh, they're not able to afford the down payment because they're paying off their student yeah. loans. Yeah. That's a driving cause of that. And in addition to lack of wage growth, so you're seeing this, you also have uh, people who are permanent renters that are coming, coming of, they're about to come to retirement age. I mean, there's a whole wave of people mm -hmm. that aren't going to have that nest egg. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom, thank God, had uh, her house on the Cape. Mm -hmm that we were able to sell, and I got her into moderate assisted living. She needs assistance. Uh, but a lot of families don't have that, a lot of folks who are, see, who are coming to retirement age. So we have, we have real deep systemic problems. Ownership is a big deal. I just I don't want to lose sight of that. Ownership um, of a home, ownership uh, yeah, of a small exactly, business, exactly. the ability to build, exactly, build wealth. Exactly. I think that's important yeah, to yeah, yeah. be on the table. Yeah. A lot of people aren't talking. Before we move into, like, Today and tomorrow, I, I, I do want to reminisce just a little bit more. <laughs> so the first thing I'd like you to do is explain to our, our viewers why I would have been a better governor than you. <laughs> is that a trick trick? It's that true. Trick no, question? it's, it's <laughs> a fact-based. <laughs> <laughs> we used to do that little co-thing. Yeah, yeah. Right? Co-governor thing, right? Yeah, co-governor. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Innovation. I should have run for lieutenant yeah, exactly. governor with you, right? That would have, <laughs> I, I didn't say it. You yeah, said yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm older than you are. Right? <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, I, I, what was the weirdest, funniest, strangest thing, if you can haul one out from the campaign trail? We went to a lot of oh, uh, oh, my unusual events. You don't have to name names of towns if you don't want to get permanently <laughs> in trouble. Um, but yeah. uh, Weirdest, wackiest just something that you go, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> that happened every day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. You uh, really go to some places that you would never, yeah, I'll tell you one of the yeah, oddities yeah. of the campaign for yeah, me. Let me, yeah. it wasn't just one thing. And you probably found this too. Yeah. When you're doing these long days, you, you, you got to find a place to stop, yeah. you know, use the restroom. Do other so we started just Dunkin' Donuts was yes. our was our place, yes. right? So it, it, we would. But that it, was my line. No, no, I, no. But no. they have they have internet. Internet. They let you sit food. there. You food. can sit there for you can sit yeah, there yeah, for yeah, hours yeah. and no one, you yeah. know. So but I we, thought that was my secret. But no, no, that no, was but that, it. No, it's that true. Was it. Thank you, Dunkin' there. Donuts. And uh, and the thing about the Dunkin' Donuts, they're the same everywhere. The they're same they're everywhere. they're clean. They're yeah. you know. So I I found we it was so funny. We we roll into a a town. Duncan, where's Duncan? Where's Duncan? You know? <laughs> I, I, had I should have kept count. I was thinking the other day. Yeah. I should have kept like a tally. 76 Duncan Donuts. Yeah. yeah. I was driving uh, through the hell country at one point and I um, uh, was with one uh, campaign uh, person and we were really tired and we were looking for coffee, but it was in the woods, you know, whew, lots of trees, yeah. trees, trees. And I said, well, you know, if, if life were fair, we'd come around the corner and there'd be Duncan Donuts. And we'd go around the corner and in the middle of some trees, there's a Dunkin' Donuts right there. <laughs> it's always, we'd it's, laugh. It's amazing. It didn't, know, yeah, it didn't matter yeah, where you were. Yeah, yeah, it was there, there. I remember one uh, event that uh, I remember you and me looking at each other because it was the event on the Cape, which had been organized by uh, high school students. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we that was to a, tell that story. That. Uh, yeah, but we, I spent the afternoon thinking about how to respond to the questions of eager um, high school students. And we got there, and there were four high school students who were the panel, and everybody else there was over 70. Um, so <laughs> all of my questions, That's true. all of my answers That's for true. young people, you young people should really get involved in politics, was uh, we had to pivot. Um, yeah. But they did answer, ask really brief questions. That was the really good thing, is that the young people uh, went straight to the question, didn't grandstand, didn't give a speech yeah, before the true. question. Um, they true. would just say, what is your education policy? Or how are you going to fix this? And I was waiting for the wind up, you know. So that <laughs> <laughs> but any yeah, other? Well, speaking of high school students, yeah. you know, not to get to go back to policy, one of the other things, lower the age of 16, Vote. Voting age. Yeah. I, I really believe in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you saw, you're seeing just a remarkable amount of activism with young mm -hmm. people now. I loved the fact that the Parkland students did what they did in mobilizing. And I also love the fact that they went to inner city Chicago, mm -hmm. where there's constant 
gun violence and mm -hmm. communities of color. It wasn't an isolated effort. They, they are, and they have traction. So I just encourage, so I, I, that was the other thing I, I just thought of when you mentioned high schools. Mm -hmm. I, to build on that, are there any strategies you took in the campaign or organizations out there you see now to spark engagement, to spark the civic engagement, this, it's happening, but are there strategies out there that we can, in our show, as a society, embrace? And I know lowering the voting age, making election days easier uh, is a strategy you suggested, but is there anything out there that you, really inspires you? So I, I'm going to say something that's going to make me sound maybe like an old dude. <laughs> but oh, I'm going to say it. Though, yeah. I am, I am, I am. <laughs> He's tough. Man. He's tough. <laughs> I, I, I love the activism. I love what's happening right now. I think we desperately need young people to run for office mm -hmm. and back people that they believe in. Because at the end of the day, I appreciate the advocacy efforts and all the rest. And that there, there's, we got to grow that. The place where you can make the biggest, most systemic differences in government and putting people in elected offices is that place. So I would, I love, there, there's been a lot of people have run, I love it. We need more. We need more city, city councilors, uh, school committee members. We need, uh, and then we need people to get into government, you know, and, and help shape and run government. That's one of the, you know, think takeaways I take being a mayor. You know, I mean, I changed the trajectory of the city um, by decisions, tough decisions I made that were in the long-term interest of the community. Same needs to be said for state, same needs to be said for national. We, I really believe we got to grow this space of people so let's build on running that. and getting in government. Let's build on it. We've seen a lot of change in politics even in the last nine months. And uh, specifically, we've seen more people of color not only run but win. More women run and win. Um, you know our mutual friend Ayanna Presley, sure. who, by the way, was a uh, was a volunteer on my lieutenant governor campaign know, at the I age know. of eighteen, and um, good Train. training. Graduate. Now you said I was old, Bob. What yeah. are you doing? You're now you're, you're I was nine. You kind of okay. Nine. All right, all right. Now nine. you're dating uh, yourself. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> hard not to at this point. Um, but but uh, we're seeing this. Um, uh, wave of, uh, I mean, other than white men, and that's exciting, but we still have a ways to go. Help me, and maybe help us talk a little bit about what that kind of diversity, intersectionality uh, brings to the political conversation that's been missing, and that is, and that I hope you agree is very exciting. But what, what are your thoughts about that? We're now seeing a whole lot. I think it's fantastic. So it's I not just it's, young people, but yeah, go ahead. I think it's fantastic. Look, you're bringing a perspective into a city hall, a Congress, a governor's office, when you bring someone of color, someone from a, of a different experience. Mm -hmm. You're bringing that perspective into the office, which is so important mm -hmm. in making these huge decisions we're talking about. I mean, we're, you talk about economic inequality. You talk about, you mentioned, there's a number of people you talk to, I talk to too, that you know, during our campaign that said, "What's the, everything's fine. Yeah, Everything, We're good, we're good. What's, what's, what's the issue here, Seti? What's the issue here, Bob? Yeah. You bring a person with another perspective into that office, they're able to use their platform, pull the levers of power uh, to even the playing field. And enhance people. the voice of people who, who we didn't hear so from. So important. Mm -hmm. So I love this, you yeah. know, I ought to, uh, and I work together at Santa Carey's office mm -hmm. as well, and I, I think it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. and, but more, we need more. We need, we need people to support candidates. We don't have public fi campaign financing, right. so right. we need to have people that have resources support those voices in those candidates. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of support, um, one of the things that I don't think regular folks uh, ponder very much is how challenging a campaign can be for a candidate's family. Mm. And um, I know that uh, you were running uh, and you had your extraordinary wife, Tassie, you had two she kids. Um, <laughs> my wife, Ann, uh, was all in and helped with policy and they have to put up with the 24 hour kind of, even if you're not doing stuff, you're thinking about it, you're worrying about it. So tell me a little bit about that dimension. Um, about Tassie's role, about you know balancing the role as a dad. You had this extraordinary dad and mom. You know how do you be a parent and a, a spouse 
when you're running for office. It is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, it, there are days, you know, and I was mayor for eight years, you remember, yeah, so sure. there are days, you know, on the trail where, you know, I knew I was missing so much. Yeah. And I knew that my daughter needed to talk to me, my son needed me to be around, and it's really hard. Mm -hmm. you, you try to intermittently be present, mm -hmm. but to your point, mm -hmm. you are still thinking, you're still on your iPhone, you're still you know, fielding mm -hmm. questions even in your mind about yeah, what you're gonna yeah. do the next day. Uh, so it's really hard. I was, I've incredibly unfort uh, been fortunate to have such a great partner in Tassie. I mean, she was a remarkable woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't have been able to be out there with you if not for her. Mm -hmm. But it really is hard. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a, after I got out of the race, mm -hmm. one of the things I realized is how much I was missing. Yeah, yeah. After I got out of the race in, in April, you know, it's not just attending the game or the play, but it's that, you know, being home at 5 p.m. and sitting and listening and talking mm -hmm. and hearing what's on your child's mind. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not gonna, just because you're there for an hour doesn't mean they're gonna download That's to you all their something. concerns yeah. and you know, this, that. So uh, one of the gifts in, in not being in that life is being able to be there. Mm -hmm. And I have been able to be there, but it's really hard. It's really yeah. hard, particularly with younger kids. It's yeah. hard. I remember uh, reading about President Obama, you know, I think he had a rule that as much as possible, most of the time, he had dinner with his family at 6.30, even if he had something else. And I love these descriptions of their family conversations where they would go, you know, Sasha, what did you do today, and Malia, and there'd be all this talk about school. And then maybe at the end of the uh, evening, uh, one of the daughters would say, Daddy, what did you do today? Um, <laughs> 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 and, uh, but I just, you know, that attempt to balance it. And um, the one thing I'll say that I was special, Yeah. So both my kids got into my camp, our campaign. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were invested. They didn't know all the policy issues. Yeah, yeah. You remember seeing my daughter out there and so yeah, yeah, I used to take yeah. my kids out on the trail. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was a special experience for them because mm -hmm. they saw their parents, both of us, dedicated to this. Giving. Yes, giving. public yeah. service. Yeah. Willing to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. So on the positive, and we still talk about the campaign, and they're, they're civically minded mm -hmm. because of my service and Tassie's service. So mm -hmm. that's, that'll stay with them for the rest of their lives, and that's a good thing. Well, I look forward to supporting one of them for <laughs> <Okay>. office. <laughs>